Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. All right, so we're just about ready to start here. Just a reminder, um, please stay on mute. If you have questions, um, ask them in the chat box and then we will get to them as we go along. Um, this morning we have alternatives to invasive plants. Nancy Berlin, our Master Gardener Coordinator and Natural Resources Specialist is going to present. And I think we've got everybody in. So Nancy, you wanna take it away? Sure. I think there'll be people joining us, Thomas, because we've only got about half of the registered people in. But I'm, I'm happy to be with you today. And um, I, I work for the Cooperative Extension Office in Prince William, and we are busier than we've been in a long time. Uh, people are very, very interested in gardening right now, and we are happy to be here to assist with research-based information. We have Master Gardeners staffing our Extension Horticulture Help Desk, and they've been busy answering questions about bees and murder hornets and lawn care and uh, so many topics. So we are happy to continue to do that online virtually for you when, as our office is closed. We have, a, we have upcoming classes on Wednesday mornings at 11. Um, we've, we've scheduled out until I think the beginning of June. So I'll, I'll share at the end of the presentation the next two classes that are coming up. So if you wanna join us at 11 o'clock for the next two Wednesdays, you can um, join then. Uh, we'd like you to register by noon um, the day before so that we can make sure everybody gets the proper link sent out. But if um, you don't, you can always view it on um, YouTube later because we, we record these and we have a lot of resources now on our YouTube channel that we didn't have before. Lots of educational material from anywhere from how to mulch, how to get started in your vegetable garden, uh, how to put up an arbor for your um, squashes in your vegetable garden, all sorts of really interesting topics, how to mulch properly, how to plant a tree. So take a look at our YouTube channel. I'll be giving that link to you later too, um, multiple times. Um, this stay at home time is a really good time to monitor your landscape for invasive plants and to consider planting some native plants instead. Um, if you need natives to plant, um, uh, there are a lot of nurseries that are still open and um, some of them have curbside pickup, um, some of them have mail order, um, some deliver. So you can check on the Plant Nova Natives website and there's a list of vendors there. You can also give us a call and we'll send you a written list. Keep in mind that um, everybody's working as hard as they can at our office virtually and at these nurseries to make sure your needs are getting met. But um, please be patient with us as we try to fulfill all the requests for information. We're happy to do it. This presentation is barely gonna scratch the surface. Um, I'm gonna present some of the more, more common uh, invasive plants. Uh, the last presentation last Wednesday was all on invasive management. And you can view that on our YouTube channel. Um, I'm gonna um, cover some of my favorite natives and some of the Northern Virginia natives. Um, but again, I'm, it's only gonna barely scratch the surface. So at the last slide, we'll give you resources where you can identify uh, the plants. And if you can't identify them, you can send us pictures to our Extension Horticulture Help Desk. So let's get started. Uh, let me see if I can get the next screen to go. So here's the definition of what an invasive plant is. And this is tossed, invasive, that word is tossed around an awful lot, but this is the United States government's definition, that it's not native to the ecosystem that you're looking at. And its introduction, here's the important part, causes economic, environmental, or harm to human health. And so um, a lot of times people will say, oh, that plant is invasive when it's a native plant. And really, a native plant can't be invasive because it's indigenous to this area, but it can be aggressive. I have some plants in my yard that I have to keep my eye on because 
Uh, we know that the first year that a native plant sleeps and the second year it creeps and the third year it leaks and then you want to divide it and give it to friends. But it is not invasive. It might be a, a rather aggressive native, but an, an invasive is a different animal. So let's look at this. So here's some characteristics of invasive plants. Most of them are from Eurasia. And that's because we, we are at about the same latitude as um, the Asian uh, countries. And, and um, so we have about the same climate, about the same, we don't have the same soil, but um, they, they tend to thrive here because they thrive there. But uh, invasives can vary from region to region. What is uh, invasive out west might not be invasive here. Um, what is invasive in one state might not be invasive in another state. They tend to thrive in disturbed areas. So if you disturb some soil or you take some plants out, that seed bank is ready and willing to germinate and, and grow. And um, that's when invasives take advantage and move in. They tend to leaf out and mature before native plants um, can even get going. They tend to outcompete natives. They have bigger, big leaves and they're fleshy and, and they cover the area so a native plant can't can't stand a chance. They're not evil plants. I mean, I, that's anthropomorphism, okay? But they're plants out of place and, and they don't serve the purposes of our ecosystem. They provide limited or no wildlife value. They're characterized by rapid growth and maturity again. They have profuse seed production, and they're highly successful at propagation, either through rhizomes or stolons or um, heavy seeding. It's very expensive to remove them, either in terms of physical labor cost for our localities to remove them. There's few or no natural controls because those are back where the plant originated. Those, that's where the controls are. Deer don't even eat most of our native plants, I mean, our invasive plants. They can mix genetically with natives where there's been some recent research on that causing genetic pollution. So our natives will be interspersed with the, with the um, invasives and, and cause a genetic change, which is scary. So here's a comparison side by side. Our native species, they occur, occur here in this, in your area without human intervention. They were typically on North America continent prior to European settlement. And again, they have natural checks and balances. We know that if we have a native plant in our yard, it's probably going to get eaten. And that that's means that your yard is an ecosystem if your plants get eaten. I have a lot of coneflowers that already have lots and lots of holes in them because the fritillary caterpillars are taking, taking that tissue and using it to grow stronger into fritillary butterflies um, and skippers also. So, um, so if your plants are eaten, know that you're doing something right. Um, we tend to think of uh, plants being eaten as a bad thing, but um, our native plants serve a purpose in the ecosystem. Non-native species, now these are not invasive, but they're non-native. Uh, they're introduced. They may have an economic value. Garden centers are making some money off of them. It may be an agricultural product or a forestry product. And they don't really pose a threat to our ecosystem, at least right now. They haven't been classified um, as, as invasive. Um, invasive species, though, re reproduce rapidly and spread quickly over large areas and again have few natural controls. So here, no shame involved here if you have any of these in your yard. Invasives are chosen because they're colorful, they're exotic, they catch your eye, and, the, and there, many of them are available commercially in big box stores, in garden centers, in you know boutiques. I um, mean, you, you still find an awful lot of these. So. Vinca uh, is, is, a, you know, it, it is a problem solver. People come to us all the time and say, I have this slope and I am really trying to get it covered so it doesn't erode anymore. And I want something that will grow really, really fast. Well, that's probably going to be your invasives. So be suspicious of something that's a fast grower. Um, 
So liriope serves that purpose a lot of times, but liriope spreads by, by uh, rhizomes and it spreads rapidly and it's very difficult to eradicate and it escapes into natural areas. Um, and uh, I just finished, just so there's no shame involved here, I just finished removing a, a huge area of liriope in my yard. And finally, after you know 10 years of looking at it and putting in some sedges instead. Uh, because sedges will provide the same kind of ground cover, but will also provide some habitat and nectar sources. Um, they, they, yes. Quick question. Um, when does a non-native species become naturalized? Hmm. Good question. I think we're still grappling with that question. I don't think we have the answer to that. And some non-native species now um, that we used to just think were innocuous are now being classified as invasive. I have a few plants in my yard that are non, I mean, I have a lot of plants that are not native, but I have a few that I suspect over time will become uh, on the invasive list. So I think that each one is a, you have to, you have to look at each particular plant specifically to see whether it naturalizes. And you know what, I, I just, I come to the, get to the point often when I'm working in my garden that I think I might have to learn to live with this one because I just can't keep up, you know, with it. So, um, day orange daylilies are considered invasive and this chameleon plant, you could see why somebody, it's down in the bottom right hand corner, you could see why somebody would buy that. It spreads rapidly, it's got, it's colorful, um, but it is a bear to get rid of. Really, really fast spreader, really, really difficult to eradicate. So knowing what you're buying first is, um, is, a, is a good rule of thumb. So when you're removing invasive plants, there are some lookalikes, okay? So there are some native plants that look like invasive plants. And sometimes it takes us a little bit to, to ID plants too. But if you need help identifying, you can ask us for help by emailing a photo of the, of the plant or when we're open again, bringing us a sample uh, to our help desk, mastergardener at pwcgov.org. And we're gonna give you the proper research-based control techniques. Before you remove the invasives, plan what you're gonna replace it with. Always choosing the right plant for the right place. We can help you with that. Or, you know, knowledgeable people at garden centers can help you with that also. Plan to be persistent and monitor for regrowth. I, as I discussed last week, many of these require chemical application to eradicate them. And even then you need to do that repeatedly and monitor. And remember, we won't give a chemical recommendation unless we've ID'd the plant for you correctly. And you must follow directions. That's a legal agreement between you and the maker of the, of the chemical. And you must wear appropriate personal protection. Here's some terms that come up a lot. And um, I noticed Suzanne is on here too. I'm, she's in my chat box here. So Suzanne, if you have a comment on this, she's very knowledgeable about native plants, but cultivars. You often find cultivars in box stores or garden centers, and they're almost always clones. They might be sterile, or they might be a naturally occurring variant or hybridized. Um, for example, Achillea millifolium is yarrow, and the white yarrow is the straight species. But Achillea millifolium paprika, with the, with the quote mark on either side of the paprika, is a, is a cultivar that the flower color is changed to a kind of a burgundy, rusty red with some yellow in it. And so sometimes a cultivar, and I'll give you a little bit more information about this, can be um, a good alternative. Uh, and um, for example, this Monarda fistulosa pictured here, this is the cultivar Claire Grace, and it's considered a nativar. And it, Monarda fistulosa is a native plant. Claire Grace is mo modified slightly, not by color, not for leaf shape, not for flower shape, not for leaf color, but it's a more resistant to downing, or powdery mildew. Because we know that bee balm or Monarda fistulosa um, gets powdery mildew. And so 
uh, there's been some um, research, excellent research done at Mount Cuba under Doug Tallamy um, from the University of Delaware under his direction. And they've, they are looking at which of these native Rs or slightly modified straight species um, are still attractive to our beneficial insects and pollinators. Because we know that these insects are really important to our um, ecosystem and we want to make sure that we haven't modified a plant so that it still is attractive. So a native R is a natural variant. Okay, it can be found in the wild and, and cultivated, but it also can be developed by a plant breeder. So here's the link for Mount Cuba Center. If you ever get a chance after this uh, pandemic is over to go up there and see their research, they pretty much station grad students by, by a plant and they count how many and the diversity of the insects that visit these slightly altered native Rs. Now back to a straight species that occurs naturally in a given location or region. For example, let's go back to Achillea millifolium. The straight species would be Achillea millifolium and that's common yarrow and it's got a white flower. And I have it in my yard as a ground cover and it's covered with beneficial wasps and flies and bees and uh, lots of really uh, good insect visitors. Now a local ecotype is the same species, but it's endemic to a certain geographical area. It might have some distinct characteristics or it might just be distinct for that region. Um, EPA has a echo uh, region map online that you can uh, take a look at to find out what echo region you're in. And a really good resource for this, um, for plants in, in our eco region is Ursanga, and that's a, a nonprofit native plant nursery in Springfield. And um, they have only local ecotypes to the Northern Virginia area. Um, and um, so uh, you can go to their website and they have a listing. Um, they usually have plant sale a couple times a year. They've had to um, delay that this year, um, but they're a great resource for finding out what's local to our area. This is a slide from last week's presentation. And with all the rain we've had, it's a good time to be pulling out invasive plants. Lucky you. So you're gonna pry up a section of the soil with a shovel or a spade, and you're gonna try to disturb the soil as little as possible. I know that's almost impossible, but the, that seed bank of invasive plants in that soil is huge. For example, stiltgrass. Each little stiltgrass plant, and I'll show you some pictures of that, that in a few minutes, has a thousand seeds per plant. You know, once it goes to seeds and those seeds ripen and um, um, they remain viable for five years too in the soil. Garlic mustard, I'll show you a picture of that in a few minutes. It's, uh, when it's a vigorous plant, it can have 7,900 seeds. Who do you think counted all those? <laughs> I just can't even imagine. But that's a lot of seeds that you're dealing with. And again, they persist in the soil. So that's little soil disturbance as you can do, the better. Start from one side and do one section at a time and only do as much as you can um, handle to get it covered again, either with uh, mulch or um, with other plants that you wanna put in. You're gonna bag up all the pieces because invasive plants are very um, crafty. <laughs> they can reestablish themselves through small pieces and replant immediately with appropriate plants and go back and monitor. Uh, I have wisteria that took me five years to eliminate, but I still catch it going underground, under the turf into other areas and springing up again. So I have to go back and look regularly and I would advise you to so here's some reasons for natives, and probably if you're here, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but our suburban lots are ideal places for an integrating native plant. You can make a difference in our ecosystem just by putting in native plants in your yard and removing invasives. They're well suited to our climate and our soils. They improve water quality by soaking up stormwater and filtering it. And um, because they don't need pesticides or, or any kind of fertilizer, those, those don't have runoff effects. Uh, they provide, to me, this is the most exciting, they provide habitat and biodiversity in our yards. It's something you can do for our environment in your own piece of the 
piece of the pie. They reduce heat um, and again, they enhance it. They're beautiful. And there are good alternatives to those showy, exotic, invasive plants. For example, this bottle gentian, it, I mean, I can't even imagine a prettier flower, although I have lots of favorites. Uh, this is um, from Ursanga. Um, it's, a, it's a local ecotype. It's, so it's uh, native to our Northern Virginia area. So um, we're gonna look at some pictures now and the natives that are specific to Northern Virginia are noted with two asterisks in this presentation, okay? If it's native to the East Coast or native to Virginia in general, they, it won't have the asterisk, but I've included many Northern Virginia ecotypes in this. Remember, just one more, one more reminder, if you have a plant that your concern is invasive, take a photo, two me megabytes, two to three megabytes per email is probably a good rule of thumb for emailing us pictures and then do multiple emails if you have to send a couple, if you have to send three or four pictures. And again, no chemical recommendations will be given without proper identification. Choose a recommend, and we're gonna give you research-based chemical control, but you must take the responsibility of wearing proper protection, reading the labels carefully. And again, you probably will need multiple applications for invasives. Okay, so let's take start with invasive vines. We've already talked, okay, if you have an invasive vines, good rule of thumb, don't allow it to climb up a tree. You, can, you probably have all seen this when you've been hiking or I have a couple of these in my office to show people, but um, this is probably bittersweet over here. And this is probably either um, Japanese uh, honeysuckle or could be bittersweet too, but you can see what it does to the to the tree. English ivy, of course, is um, one of the main offenders, and it's really pretty easy to identify. You all probably know this, and but I bet you haven't seen many of those berries because the birds have probably eaten the berries to spread it further. The leaf form can be variable, um, and um, the, again, the dense foliage blocks sunlight and restricts other plants. Heavy vines can damage or kill mature trees. And it loosens the bark. And then underneath that, it holds moisture against the trunk, which brings decay and fungal diseases. And if vines get too heavy, any of these vines that we'll talk about, um, it can take down a tree. If, it, if the tree gets top heavy, uh, it can topple a tree during wind or snow or icy conditions. And this is a fairly new um, discovery that um, it harbors bacterial scorch, which um, we've had some samples come into our office, which is a disease of maples, oaks, and elms. So um, again, take down the uh, take down the ivy, and um, we can give you um, the the procedures for that. Or Japanese honeysuckle is another one. Uh, it has opposite leaves, opposite on either side of the stem. Um, and it starts out herbaceous or has stems you can kind of bend. And then later on as it matures, it gets woody. Uh, so it might fool you. The other thing that fools you is that it can have just these ovate leaves with no teeth, but, or it can have um, like these over here that are um, lobed. So um, sometimes you can, I'll do a double take and I'll think, wait, that's, Japanese honeysuckle right there, even though it, um, it looks a little different to me. Here's some other invasive vines. We covered a lot of these last week. Um, Mile a Minute uh, has little barbs on the stems. Um, it has a triangular little leaf. It's also called tear thumb because it makes you cry when you get it stuck in your thumb. Um, and it also, there's a native um, plant that looks a little similar, which is hog peanut which is a ground cover or vine that I have in my yard, but it doesn't have the barbs on it. So again, you, you want to be careful that you're IDing it correctly. This one's porcelain berry, and you can see why somebody would want to buy this plant. All the purple and blue and aqua um, berries, um, but it is treacherous, uh, especially in the eastern part of Prince William County, growing over trees and uh, covering the ground, um, just profuse um, seeding because of all those berries that are attractive to birds. 
Chinese Mysteria is a nemesis in my neighborhood. I'm afraid it started in my yard a long time ago before I ever got here. And now um, I'm still eradicating it in my yard after eight years. Um, you can see the pods are velvety, the leaves are opposite. Um, and here it is covering uh, tr mature trees with purple flowers and it's flowering right now. Although there are other purple flowering things right now too that are invasive. Um, and so um, this is our oriental bittersweet, uh, really pretty plant. My mom used to cut it and put it in fall arrangements and, and you can barely find the native bittersweet any longer in natural areas. If you go to the Manassas battlefield, it's all over there. Um, and you can see that the, br the bright berries attract birds and they spread it. And that was what was girdling that tree in the previous picture. So let's look at a happier topic. Let's look at some alternatives to these. So here's the American bittersweet. And um, Suzanne, um, is this, have you ever seen this for available in the trade? Can you shake your head yes or no? Suzanne Conway? No. Anyway, I think it's a little bit hard to find, but the berries are yellow instead of that orange. Here is the native alternative to Japanese honeysuckle, and this is a na Northern Virginia native. Um, and you can see it's just, it's beautiful. It's blooming now. Hummingbirds like it. What could be better? Um, it's it's not not difficult to control. Uh, have it on a you know a lattice. This is uh, Carolina um, jessamine, and um, it is not native to Northern Virginia. It blooms in the late winter, early spring, um, and so that's kind of a nice thing to see some yellow. It's native to the East Coast, m more south of here, but certainly could be considered. Question? Anybody? Yeah, Suzanne, you go. Okay, and this is our native clematis or clematis, it doesn't matter how you say it, um, uh, virgin's bower. And um, I'm gonna hopefully put this in my yard soon. Look at these native Virginia vines. Now, this first one, the bignonia, is just beautiful. I saw it in bloom at our teaching garden last week. And this is not to be confused with the trumpet creeper. Trumpet creeper is the orange flowery vine that has a trumpet-like flower, which is also native, but it's pretty darn aggressive. Remember, we're not going to say it's, it's invasive because it's native, but it's uh, very, very aggressive, and uh, you need to uh, have a place where it could go crazy. Uh, the bignonia might be an alternative to that or the um, native honeysuckle. But this is cross vine is the common name. It's a Northern Virginia native. Um, this is the native wisteria, American wisteria. This is also at our um, at our teaching garden on the monastery grounds. And you can see it has a pea-like flower, like a sweet pea or a garden pea. And um, that shape, that, and it, it, it is a legume. It is in the um, ABACA family, same, same as peas. Um, it's, you can find this in the trade. This is purple, um, purple passion flower. Um, it, looks so exotic it doesn't even look like it belongs in Virginia but sure enough it's a northern Virginia native it has an edible fruit it's a vine it's it's not particularly aggressive um, I think it's an incredible looking plant it looks otherworldly to me and here's the other uh, passion flower uh, that's uh, native to Vir northern Virginia it's the yellow passion flower I saw this over in the western part of the county in a subdivision uh, growing in a natural area this is butterfly pea. This should not be confused with um, an invasive called Asiatic dayflower. Uh, this is a vine. Asiatic dayflower is a, just a, has a stem and is an herbaceous plant. And this is fuzzy pink beans. This is my a new addition to my landscape. It's not native to Northern Virginia, but it's native to, to Maryland, just over the line from us. So I have it growing in a pot with a little um, trellis on it. And it's a, it's a very delicate, um, little vine. Nancy? Yes. Really quick, um, do any of these work as ground covers? Yeah. And we're going to cover some for ground. Let me see. Um, none of those. Um, 
I wouldn't use any of these particularly, but there are some some uh, other plants, uh, you know, like Virginia creeper, love it or hate it, it's native. And I use that as a ground cover in my yard and that's a, that's a native vine. Um, there will probably be some pictures later too. Um, and there are other alternatives to ground covers too. So let's look at some herbaceous plants and herbaceous just means it's not woody, it's got a soft stem. Okay, so these are, the, we talk, talked about liriope already. Beefsteak plant was brought in probably as a Asian cooking herb. Um, you'll find it a lot um, in riparian or streamside areas, and it has a smell of licorice. Um, it is rampant along a lot of our streams in Prince William. Garlic mustard, we talked about that a little bit last week. It has um, these seed pods that are called sleeks, sleeks. And each one of them um, has, each plant, remember, 7,900 7, uh, seeds per vigorous plant. This is rampant around uh, the eastern part of the county, particularly by the Occoquan, I know in particular, but also Fairfax County parks are carpeted in lesser celandine, and um, it's also called fig buttercup. Really difficult to get rid of, has a corm. A couple plants, I don't remember where I bought them, doesn't matter, but I, I planted them and it had those, the corms in the soil. So um, once I noticed that that was there, I dug it up and uh, made sure I threw it away and went back and I monitor that several times during each season to make sure that it's not re-sprouting from that. Really difficult to get rid of. So if you, if you think you see it, I mean, it's a pretty flower and you think, wow, that's nice looking. <laughs> and then, then you realize that it's an invasive and it's just really hard to get a, get a hold of once it gets out of hand. Again, we talked about chameleon, a lot more listed by the, at w these websites here. And that will be mentioned again on the last slide. Now these would be good ground covers we talked about uh, using these as a ground cover instead. Um, but I really think Virginia creeper works if you have kind of a naturalized garden. Too. So top left, uh, Packera aria, golden ragwort, uh, has really cute purple little, little purple buds, uh, spreads pretty rapidly. Is, is it, I would say it was an aggressive spreader uh, by the third year, you should have a pretty good covering of this. Um, this is uh, um, green and gold. It likes partial sun, a um, little more sun than I've given it in the past. I've just moved mine. But nice uh, dark green leaves, uh, yellow flowers. This would uh, could compete if you remove the lesser celandine. This is a favorite of mine. I just covered a hillside with this. It's the only sedum that I know that's native and does well in the shade, sedum ternatum, wild stone crop. We, uh, uh, Master Gardeners put in a healing garden at Novant, uh, Prince William, and you can go there and one whole area is covered with sedum ternatum. And it's, it's blooming right now, has these white feathery flowers, and then it has this nice sedum-like succulent um, leaves. This is a sweet little woodland. Um, these are all for sh shade to partial sun. Uh, this is a uh, uh, partridge, partridge berry, uh, little red berries that birds and amphibians and um, reptiles like, cute little flower. Dark green leaves stay dark green all winter and with a lighter uh, midrib. This is a, not a very good picture, but it's, um, uh, phlox. Yeah, oh, I'm blocking it. I can't, because I can't see it. Okay, there we go. Phlox of Vericata, woodland phlox, blue, um, and then Tiarella. Um, I didn't think my Tiarella was going to take off, but uh, by the third year, it's covered a whole area of my woods in the uh, early spring, and it's it's got lovely basil leaves that remain after the flower blooms, so it's kind of a nice, interesting native these are some more for shade, some more native plants for shade. Um, wild ginger, um, really nice, dense ground cover. Nothing will grow under this once you get it established. And it, its flowers are 
hiding underneath the leaves and they're burgundy flowers and they're uh, preferred by real early pollinators, uh, flies and, and some of the fuzzier bumble, fuzzy or fuzzier bees. This is Salvia Lorata, uh, stays evergreen all winter and then kind of is turning purple right now, has a spiky flower coming out the top, reseeds, it is covering, uh, doing a really good job um, coverage uh, for me, keeping weeds out of one area for me. And this is Conoclinium Coelestium, blue mist flower, um, this is a, all three of these are Northern Virginia natives. Um, right now it's um, not blooming yet, but it has a feathery blue flower come June, July, August. Um, sometimes I think it'll probably bloom a little earlier than August this year. Um, and the leaves are just coming up now and it spreads, it spreads quite nicely. Again, here's Heuchera uh, Americana. Now, there are a lot of hookahs out there available in the trade. There's ones that are kind of caramel colored. There's orange, there's burgundy, there's lime green. I prefer this hookah Americana because when you change the leaf color, um, it becomes less palatable to important insects and caterpillars that need it for a food source. And it's a Northern Virginia native. It has a, it has a spike and then a feathery white flower. Ferns make a really good shade, um, shade ground cover. And this is maidenhair fern right here, one of my favorites. And it goes kind of in a circular pattern. But uh, Christmas fern, marginal wood fern, southern lady fern, they're all Northern Virginia natives. And then, oops, sorry, oops. And then there's a, a, several different violets. This is a uh, birdfoot violet, uh, but just common blue violets are an important host plant for fritillary butterflies. And so leaving them, and they, they're sturdy plants. After they're done blooming, uh, the leaves remain and um, it's, it has a, a corm uh, for the root, root structure. And um, so it's a sturdy plant that will um, cover an area quite quickly. I have some uh, violets that have been there five or six years and, and they're leaves are about eight inches wide right now from just from maturity, amazing. Um, Anemone canadensis is, um, is okay for sun or partial sun and it's the top left. It's not a Northern Virginia native, but it is native to Virginia and the East Coast. Uh, it's blooming right now, has white flowers that look just like that and um, kind of covers the area nicely with those um, fan-like leaves. This one is uh, pussy toes, uh, basil leaves, oops, sorry, basil leaves right here, and then a spike, and then little fuzzy toes <laughs> uh, that, that grow up out of it. It likes poor soil. It likes really poor soil, rocky soil. Uh, it, would, it even will grow like roadside um, in the full sun, uh, you know, and not be affected by salt or anything. It's one tough plant. And this is our uh, native strawberry. This is not the one that you'll see in your yard most commonly. If it has a yellow flower, that's not the native. Um, that's, a, that's a weedy version that I'm almost ready to call invasive. But this has white strawberry-like flowers and um, preferred by many of, the, um, many of our uh, solitary <coughs> bees. This, this is Zizia aurea, and it's a little tall for a ground cover, but I think it does a, it has an umbrella-shaped flower that's preferred by a lot of the beneficial insects and covers the ground nicely. Um, and uh, it really just brings a bright spot into a, a kind of a, a naturalized area. Let's look at some invasive shrubs. So um, Nandina, um, uh, a lot of people have these in their yards. I was taking a hike the other day and um, really saw a lot of the berries. And um, the berries are highly toxic to birds. Um, when they're exposed to the air, they can the cyanide gets activated and alkaloids are in it that kill birds, um, particularly cedar waxwings and cardinals. Um, that would be a good reason to remove it from your, from your landscape. It's considered a noxious weed by Department of Agriculture. 
So we'll give you some alternatives to that. Euonymus uh, burning bush is, is um, really uh, an eye-catching plant, especially in the fall when it turns bright red. But you can see in this picture here, the, the berries are quite um, attractive to birds and um, it will spread uh, in where it shouldn't be, in, a lot, in you know, vacant lots, wooded areas, roadsides, um, uh, really, really has, is becoming a problem. So there's better alternatives. Uh, Japanese barberry is a dense, deciduous, spiny shrub. Uh, sometimes it's used around uh, for security reasons to put a or to keep deer out of places um, because it has the thorns on it. And it has these very attractive red berries, but you don't often see these red berries because a lot of animals spread those. Uh, it provides a great habitat for white-footed mice, and they're the carrier for the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. One infected mouse can transfer bacteria to many, many ticks that ride along with them on their back. And then those ticks hop off and find a new host, whether it be you or deer. And Barbary thickets are a little bit warmer, they're protected, and so they're a great habitat for these uh, white-footed mice to live in. So if, if you don't want, if you want to avoid ticks, removing Barbary is a good idea. Spirea japonica, uh, Japanese meadowsweet, really pretty plant. Single plant produces hundreds and hundreds of small seeds and they're lightweight and they're dispersed by water or air. Um, it's, it's common in the trade. It's very, um, you, it's commonly planted along with the, all the other ones I mentioned. This is the bane of my existence, privets. They're native to Europe and Africa and Asia and there is a Chinese privet. Uh, Augustrum um, sinense, uh, and the blue berries are abundant, and each of those berries forms little shrubs in your, in the, wherever they drop or where birds carry them. They have a fragrant white flower. Uh, they have opposite leaves, opposite shiny leaves. Uh, I finally took three of these down that were in my neighbor's yard once after getting permission, because pulling up the little seedlings was taking me hours and hours and hours. And uh, I just, and now I look and they're, they're growing back. So I mean, like I said, it's gonna be a monitoring process. You have to be persistent. Nancy? Now you have butterfly bush in your yard. And again, no shame here. I'm just gonna educate you. Nancy? Um, this is, yes. Um, just a quick clarification. Um, what species of Nandina were you talking about being invasive? Domestica. Okay. Um, because there is a publication uh, on the VCU website that does talk about uh, Nan Nandina domestica. And it's not, as a point of clarification, it's not necessarily to promote it. Um, it's more of a pro plant profile. Um, it's also an older Profile. publication. Mm -hmm. um, and just so yeah. anyone who was confused by that, um, that's there and it's also there for the more for the nursery industry. Um, we yeah. generally don't recommend Nandina um, at all anymore. It, it's one that's of those where it was recommended before we realized it was a problem. Right. It's only been in the last, I would say, three years that information has come out about the cyanide and the alkaloids in the berries. So, and you that, know, you, go ahead. I was going to say, that, that publication is at least five years old. Yeah. yeah they're, it's hard to keep up, you know. And again, you know, some of the things that I think are in my yard now that are not native, you know, I'm suspicious that they might become in time um, more of a problem. So um, butterfly bush, um, you'll see a lot of butterflies nectaring on this, but you'll never see a caterpillar on it. Um, to, be a, to be a host plant for butterflies, it has to meet the needs of the larva and the adults. And butterfly bush has nectar, although there, there has been some information, credible information written that it's not as nutritious. 
I don't know that that's been collabor corroborated um, across a lot of publications, but it doesn't provide, uh, nothing eats the leaves. So without a host plant for the caterpillar, the larva, butterflies can't, um, can't survive. So I'm gonna show you a couple alternatives to this. There are sterile versions available now too. Um, so they don't have the heavy seeding that, that um, this one does. Amorpha fruticosa would be an alternative to butterfly bush. It's a really interesting plant. Uh, it's native to the Northern Virginia area. False indigo bush is the common name. Uh, mature size about 13 feet, although uh, I've had mine many years and it's a very slow growing shrub. It has this neat purple plume with the um, yellow, bright yellow stamen. Um, it really interesting plant, a lot of butterflies all over it all the time. So this would be an alternative if you wanted to put something in instead of butterfly bush. I think a Tia virginica, um, Virginia sweet spire might be another alternative to butterfly bush that would provide. And um, it has nice fall color. You can see in the smaller picture, there is a smaller cultivar called Henry's Garnet that's three to four feet. It's good for a suburban yard but the mature size of the straight species is about three to eight feet. The straight species is um, a Northern Virginia native. Hydrangea, wild hydrangea, about three to five feet uh, mature. Uh, a Northern Virginia native will rival any other flowering plant, I think, uh, for spring to summer blooms. Ilex verticillata is a deciduous holly. Uh, it, it loses, meaning it loses its leaves <coughs> in the winter and it leaves bare branches with red, bare, bright red berries that the birds really love. You have to have a male and a female. Uh, I have one male for about six or seven females and that seems to produce plentiful berries. So, um, you know, probably would want to buy that from, from, a, from a, a, you know, a place that could uh, tell you for sure whether, what, whether you're getting male or female. One of my favorite ornamentals is, uh, is the blueberry, either the tall bush blueberry, the low bush. Uh, the low bush only gets to about one to two feet, needs partial sun, although I have mine in full sun and it's doing fine. Acidic soils, although the soils around here seem well suited to blueberries, you can always ask us for a soil test kit for Virginia Tech and mail that off yourself with a soil sample for $10. And then we'll, we can help you um, interpret that, we get a copy of the report too. But look at the flowers on that blueberry and of course you get the fruit if the birds don't get it first. Um, and really beautiful fall color. So if you live in an HOA where you're not supposed to grow food sources in your front yard, I bet you could get away with one of these blueberries because they look like they're a beautiful ornamental plant. Uh, common elderberry uh, is, a, is a bigger shrub. Uh, about six feet or more. Uh, it likes wet areas, um, but the berries ha um, have some nutritional value that you can read more about. Uh, really pretty um, bloom on them. Amalankia um, canadensis or service berry is blooming. It's starting to bloom right now. The buds are almost open on mine. It's also called shad bush because it would bloom when the shad were running. It's a Northern Virginia native. It has really fragrant white blossoms and has beautiful, tasty berries, if you ever get any. Uh, really sweet and um, delicious. Um, the birds always get mine, <laughs> which is fine. About 15 to 30 feet, full sun to part shade. It's host to 124 species of butterflies and moths, Lepidoptera and it provides food for 40 species of birds. What a powerhouse that is from that delicate, delicate shrub. Just, I just put some button bush in my yard. Uh, even though it has Occidentalis in its name, it's a Northern Virginia native. It hosts 19 species of, um, of butterflies. Let me see if I can do this here. There we go. And um, 24 species of birds, uh, songbirds. So um, and look at those flowers. They are just incredible. They're, they're round, ball, round fuzzy balls. It does like wet areas. Um, so if you have a, 
uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be wet all the time, um, but it needs a little bit more moisture than most shrubs. Viburn native viburnums are always a good choice. Uh, this is a maple leaf viburnum here, but all, all of these are Northern Virginia natives right here. Maple leaf viburnum arrowwood, the flowers tend to look like this. And uh, most of them have uh, attractive berries for birds. 104 Lepidoptera species use native viburnums and 35 bird species. Mammals like them too. Um, this is a great ornamental plant to put in your yard. And um, they take varying degrees of sun shade. Uh, so you might wanna um, you know, consult and uh, mark these as something to look at for certain places in your yard. Now we always think of Cornus Florida as, um, as you know, native dogwood, and that certainly is a wonderful tree. But I wanted to introduce you to, to these in case you didn't, in case you weren't familiar with them, gray dogwood and silky dogwood. They're small trees. These are good for the suburban landscape, okay? They're not going to be massive trees that will overtake everything. Um, they, and they both take sun shade. Um, I'm trying both of these out in my yard too. And, and supports 118 species of Lepidoptera and beetles and 98 species of birds. This is the gray dogwood here. And after, after it blooms here, it leaves these red uh, stems where the, where the flowers fall off. I think that's really in, pretty. And, uh, that, and this is where the flowers are first. And then silky dogwood gets blueberries and um, sm little smaller white flowers. Okay, we're back to the invasives. Let's look at some trees. And there are so many trees. I, I only am going to cover a few of them. You all know about Bradford repair, right? I imagine. But if you drive down 66 in the spring, oh heck, and even, there, even in front of my office, a lot of office buildings, people have them in their yards. Um, and they were, they were brought in to as a, you know, this was the problem solver for the suburban lot and they've just escaped and they're very difficult to eradicate because of the, um, the many seeds that they produce. Um, so if you drive along 66, pretty much all the natural areas going out toward Front Royal uh, in the spring are covered with Radford pears and nothing else, nothing else is growing with them. Um, Norway maple is another uh, invasive tree. It's not suited for our area. Um, and this was my favorite tree when I was a little girl, but mimosa, very fragrant, but again, uh, is now on the invasive list and escaped our, escaped our landscapes and gone into natural areas uh, where, where we really should be um, having more native plants. Uh, having trouble switching, there we go, okay. And then there's Tree of Heaven which um, is, is probably the hardest tree to get rid of. Um, had a conversation with some, a lady in the last class who said you know, that they had a professional applicator come in and try to take it out and it, and it still didn't come out. Um, it, it takes repeated persistence. Um, you can see, look at all the seeds on this. And in its native range, it's got all these things that attack it. But it, in our area, it grows unabated, and it's actually a source, um, a, a host tree, a preferred host tree for the spotted lanternfly, which is the, a new invasive pest. This is what the leaf scar looks like, uh, and um, right here. And uh, if you break off the stem, it smells like stale peanut butter to me. And you'll see where there's not Bradford pears along 66, you'll see tree of heaven growing. It, uh, there are some lookalikes that are native, a sumac and walnut um, look sort of similar to these, but um, that's why proper ID is important. There's some smaller native trees, uh, the aronias, red and black chokeberry. There's nice small trees for suburban landscape. They support songbirds. They can grow in full sun, part shade two to eight feet tall. I cut mine back completely and now it's regrowing because it was getting top heavy and it, and it responded great to, to heavy pruning. Witch hazel, 
uh, early pollinate, this comes out in late winter, early, early spring, and the early pollinators benefit. Uh, this is a Northern Virginia native. Uh, red twig dogwood, here it is in the winter with the bare st red stems. The, um, the new growth, the new growth is, uh, it, it is brown, uh, um, the new growth is red. Let's speed it up just a little bit. Magnolia virginiana and clethora, those are good alternatives that are smaller for your suburban lot. Aeschylus pavia, um, red buckeye, beautiful for hummingbirds. Um, let's look at some, um, you're familiar with uh, Cirrus canadensis redbud, that's a larger tree. It likes the edge of the forest. The sourwood, look at those blooms on that, um, really good for pollinators. Uh, crab apple, underused tree, songbirds and pollinators depend on it. Uh, there are some disease resistant cultivars. This is sylvatica, look at the fall color on that one. Songbirds eat the berries, provides habitat. Uh, Yellowwood, un very underused tree, uh, beautiful fall color, beautiful fragrant blooms. Arpinus uh, is a host to um, the, it, or musclewood it's called. If you look at the bark, uh, it's host to these butterflies. Uh, favorite of mine, persimmon. It may take several years to bear fruit, but it, and there are some self-pollinating varieties. Quercus supports 500 species, oaks, red oaks, white oaks, 500 species of butterflies and moths. And these caterpillars are a uh, critical source for 96% of our songbirds. One pair of chickadees needs to eat, provides 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to rear one clutch of young baby chickadees. And the oak can provide that. So that's some grasses, microstegium. Contact us if you have stilt grass for uh, chemical control and maybe ground cover recommendations. Um, miscanthus and um, uh, maidenhair grass and Phragmites are both invasive grasses that we're seeing more and more of in native er in, uh, in a lot of natural areas. Uh, here's some natural native ground covers to compete against stilt grass. You can review these later. I'm running a little short on time here. Again, carexes or or sedges. There's carex for every every condition that you could have: dry, shade, wet, wet, sunny. Uh, tall native grasses could replace your miscanthus, little blue stems and switch grasses. Here's some additional resources, and again, this will be posted on YouTube. Uh, next Wednesday, we have a, a, a class coming uh, up on uh, ticks, spiders, and snakes and poisonous plants. Um, and you can register at Master Gardener Desk. The following week, dealing with problem areas in your landscape, same procedure. Keep in touch on social media or check out our YouTube channel. This will be posted shortly, maybe by tomorrow or the next day. will be posted for your review. Sorry, I had to speed up the end there a little bit, but follow us on Facebook. We, we put a lot of interesting information. And uh, if we have time, Thomas, we'll take some questions. Okay. Um... I think the only question we had that didn't get answered, let me see, may have been about uh, vines. Let's see. Um, are there legislative efforts to, to ban uh, things like uh, English ivy? There are efforts, I would, and I would say that there are equal efforts on the other side to continue selling and making money from them. Um, could you back up a little bit and talk more about plants to replace stilt grass? Sure, be glad to. I, I intended to, but so. Um, I find that Achillea, great species of Achillea millefolium, common yarrow, does a good job of filling in an area and it has spreads by rhizomes. 
Uh, it's evergreen. Uh, and remember, stiltgrass is a summer annual. So uh, keeping it in check before it goes to seed is critically important. This, this uh, path rush, I've just put in uh, 200 plugs of that in an area uh, to keep the stilt grass out and it grows slowly, but it also fans out and lays over. Violets are a really good option uh, and they're usually plentiful. Uh, any of these sedges um, and would, would be a good addition to a landscape. Um, these are native sedges for wet shade and these are for dry to moist shade. Um, it really, uh, Carex pensylvanica is really adaptable to, to a lot of different areas and, and they're tall enough to compete with stilt grass. Uh, the <clears throat> Appalachia and um, you could try ferns with the sedges, that would be an option too. Uh, I, would, I would say sedges would, would be my, because they're, they're grass-like but they do provide a native plant. Uh, benefits. The, these taller ones too. Keeping the ground covered um, with with something that um, is native and uh, and it, it does take work though. It does, does take persistence. I'm probably going to go out this evening and weed my still grass myself. Um, does that answer the question? I, I'd be glad, I, we would be happy to answer more questions specifically on that, on chemical control, me, um, mechanical control, and also. Nancy, um, we have a question about, can a trumpet vine kill a walnut tree? I think we may have lost Nancy. Um, I'm not sure. I would assume uh, that a trumpet vine could theoretically kill a walnut tree, um, but generally speaking, um, it would be rare to, to see a trumpet vine that aggressive. They need sun, so the shade under a tree is, is probably not going to be ideal for aggressive growth, but it's possible depending on how negligent you are with watching it. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Uh, are witch hazel slow to grow? Um, this person has, yes. okay. Um, you mentioned wild blue fox. Phlox, are all phloxes native? No, there, uh, there are a couple that are native. Uh, if you go to the Plant Nova Natives website, you can see some choices for Northern Virginia for flocks that are native. Can you recommend mostly sh full shade plants that are butterfly hosts? Um, if we go back, oh, did I? Full shade. I, I would say Hooker Americana. I, I, I know this uh, blue mist flower would work. Um, Salvia Lorata probably. Um, uh, definitely violets. Um, green and gold. Um, I don't know about these two in particular. I'll tell you a really good resource for that information though is the Plant Nova Natives website. Just put plant nova natives in Google, or there's also a U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, manual that's online. They both have manuals online that are, have color pictures, and they have a chart um, which uh, what insects, what wildlife, birds, and what um, Lepidoptera are attracted to the specific plants. So those are both good resources. If you need those at the, at the last slide. There was a question about what's the best way to get rid of daylilies. In my experience, it's been to dig them up. Because they do spread underground, uh, I would just make sure you dig deep and dig wide and remove the soil with it. Um, 
and then keep at it. If I'm remembering correctly, and I don't have a reference in front of me, they're also difficult to control with herbicides. So yeah, digging I is would usually do the best. Yeah. Uh, let's see what other questions we have here. What's the best way to remove a chameleon plant? Oh. Um, I would pull, get as much of it out and with the, you know, make sure the soil, and then I would probably put a heavy layer of wood chips over it um, and just um, monitor it. I would mechanically remove it. We, you certainly could use a chemical, but I would like you to uh, contact us and we can give you those recommendations in an email uh, so we don't have to... Um, you know, I don't have to rush through and, and we can talk you through it. We have a question about box turtles in the yard, but stilt grass is taking over. Will 30% vinegar spray work if I'm careful to avoid the turtles? Um, the, no. Go ahead. I was going to say, so 30% vinegar, as in you using your vinegar, using vinegar from the t uh, culinary vinegar, it's not going to work. Um, there are organic herbicides that have vinegar in them. The big thing that you have to be careful about is reading the label to make sure that they're safe for um, amphibians, for reptiles, and other animals. Um, because not all of them are. Just because it's organic doesn't mean it's perfectly safe. So if, if you're not sure about what to use, uh, send us a question and say, uh, please give me some organic uh, recommendations for removing stilt grass. Um, really, probably mechanical or uh, occlusion, you know, uh, putting something over the stilt grass area would be your, what we're probably going to recommend anyway. We have a question about bagging invasives. What do you do with the bag? You put them in the trash. Um, invasives can go into the landfill while they get buried and they won't be a problem. Um, I know don't some leave them, don't leave them just laying out unless you leave them on a concrete and let them fry in the sun because uh, um, like garlic mustard has, is allelopathic and it'll it has some chemicals in it that will you lay it down it'll leach those chemicals and keep other things from growing. I know if you're in an area of the cities or the counties where there is uh, landscape debris pickup um, a lot of times the, uh, the trash folks won't want to take bagged invasives, um, but you just need to put a sign on it or put it in a trash can where they're not going to see it um, because invasives can't go to the land or can't go to um, recycling for mulching. They have to go to the landfill where they'll be buried and not become a problem. I hope you'll join us next Wednesday uh, for our next one on um, ticks and poisonous plants and snakes and spiders. Thank you all for coming and have a good rest of your day. We'll be sending out an evaluation by email in the next few days. That will also include a link to the YouTube recording of this class. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, your comments, and your suggestions for other classes. We look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for listening.